Hello, my name is G.L. Robinson, and I've written a little children's book that I hope you might like me to read to you. I wrote it for my own grandchildren to give them something to do while they're all at home and can't go to school. When I was a little girl, I used to live in England, and there was a radio program every afternoon for children, and it would tell a little story, and the announcer would always say, are you sitting comfortably? Then I'll begin. So I say to you, are you sitting comfortably? Then I'll begin. The name of the story is A Robbery in an English Castle. And it's about three friends who go from Chicago to England with their Grammy and they visit a castle. And they solve a little mystery. You'll see. I dedicated the book to my granddaughter, Lila, because she was the one who first suggested it. Top of the first page, you'll see there's a picture of the American flag and the Union Jack, which is the British flag. Chapter one, the friends. We're going to England to stay in a castle. The twins could hardly believe their good luck. Lila and Graham are eight-year-old twins, and their best friend is Keith. They live in an apartment block in Chicago. Lila and Graham are on the third floor, and Keith is on the top floor. From his apartment window, you can see right across the city to the shining water of Lake Michigan. The friends love to look at the lake, and imagine traveling to all sorts of places. It all began when their grandmother came to visit at Christmas, and one evening the twins overheard her talking with their mum and dad. They weren't trying to listen to a private conversation, but Grammy's voice is so easy to hear because she has an English accent. It would be really good for them to stay in another country, she said. And my friend Henry has invited me to stay at his place for as long as I like. Think about it. The twins' grandmother is originally from England. She told them that England is just one part of Great Britain, like Texas is part of the USA. The other parts are Scotland, Wales and Northern Ireland. There are only four parts to Great Britain. It's much smaller than the USA. Grammy's name is Louise and she writes historical novels. That's books about real history, but with made up people in them. She lives in New York, not in the city, but in a small town upstate. She says that when she first came to America, she thought New York was all New York City with skyscrapers everywhere. She was surprised when she arrived upstate and saw that there were fields and even cows. Chapter two, an invitation. A few days after their grandmother had gone home, one evening when they were having dinner, their mum said, your grandmother has invited you to go to England with her for two weeks in the summer. If we work it around your sports camps, would you like to go? The twins looked at each other. We'd love to, exclaimed Lila. We've been talking about all the places we'd like to go when we look at Lake Michigan from Keith's windows. And then they both said together, Keith, he'll be so disappointed he's not going to England, said Graham. Why don't you write to Grammy Louise and explain that your friend is as keen to travel as you are, suggested Mum. You never know, he might be able to go with you, provided his mum agrees, of course. But I suggest that Graham write the letter. You know your handwriting looks like spiders, Lila. And I put a picture in the book, which maybe you can see it. Can you see it? There it is. It's a picture of Prince Charles's handwriting. It looks like spiders, doesn't it? Prince Charles is the Queen Elizabeth II of England's son. He has pretty bad handwriting. The twins ran upstairs and, looked and knocked excitedly on Keith's door. When he opened it, they explained about the trip to England and the letter. Keith's eyes lit up. 
Oh, wow, he said. I hope your grandmother agrees, and my mom, but I bet mom will say yes if your grandmother does. Keith didn't have a dad. It was just him and his mom. Sure enough, Keith's mom was very happy to let him go to England with Grammy Louise. They had met lots of times, and Keith's mom had helped their grandmother once with a legal problem. She was a lawyer. About two weeks later, they got a reply. Dear Graham and Lila, I'm sorry for the delay, but before I could answer about Keith, I had to make sure my friend Henry was okay with it. I didn't mention it to your mum and dad, but he's an old college friend from Oxford University. And when his father died a few years ago, he became Lord Henry. He lives in a castle. Anyway, Henry said there's plenty of room for Keith. There are 18 bedrooms in the castle, so one extra person doesn't make any difference. I'll be in touch with your mum and dad about dates and everything you need, like passports and so on. Love and kisses to you both, Grammy Louise. Graham and Lila and Keith jumped for joy. They were going to England, to a castle. Now you know if you go abroad you need a passport. This is what the American passport looks like. See it? But all countries have different passports. Of course, different colours, different shape, different size. Chapter 3. The Airport in New York. Over the next few months, the three friends had their photos taken and sent in the forms to get their passports. The passport photos had to be a special size taken against a white background with very precise measurements for the size of their heads. In the end, it turned out the lady in the main post office could do it, which was a relief. Then they had to book their air tickets. It was quite expensive, and Mum said it would have to be birthday and Christmas presents rolled into one. When the day came, the twins' dad flew with them and Keith to Kennedy Airport in New York City. They could have flown direct from Chicago to London, but they were meeting Grammy Louise in New York. They had to say goodbye to the twins' dad before going through security, as only travellers could get to the planes. It was the first time any of them had ever been on vacation without their parents or flown on a plane, and they had sort of butterflies in their stomach, even though they were excited. To go through security, they had to take off their shoes, their coats and backpacks, and put them in a bin that went through a scanner and they had to put their iPads through separately. They took off their shoes and they went through a metal detector. They weren't allowed any liquids, even water, in their backpacks. Grammy said it was because some years ago, terrorists had tried to blow up an airplane with stuff mixed in water, and now security is super strict. They obviously couldn't put sharp objects in their backpacks either, but that made sense. Graham was a bit afraid that there might be terrorists on their flight, but Grammy said the security was so good nowadays, there was nothing to worry about. Here's a picture from Kennedy Airport of the way of people, I don't think you can see it very well, but of people taking off their shoes and putting their stuff into little plastic bins that go through a scanner. Chapter 4 on the plane. On the plane they found their seats and had a bit of an argument about who should sit next to the window. In the end, to stop the squabble, the twins' grandmother said she would sit there and then they would take turns. In any case, she said the flight would be mostly at night, so they wouldn't be able to see anything outside anyway. The cabin crew gave a demonstration about how to put on life vests and oxygen face masks if necessary. That was a bit scary, but Grammy Louise said she'd flown to England hundreds of times and never had a single problem. Then when the plane rolled forward faster and faster, they got butterflies in their stomach until it suddenly left the ground. Keith's ears hurt a bit from the cabin pressure, but Grammy gave them hard candies to suck, which made it better. After a while, the cabin crew rolled around a cart with drinks and snacks. They all had Dr. Peppers, which was cool because they hardly ever had those at home, and they had some pretzels. 
On the back of the seat in front of them, there were video monitors and a whole range of movies and TVs that shows that they could watch. Grammy had warned them to bring their own earphones so they didn't have to pay for any. They all chose to watch the latest Abominables movie and had just settled down when the cabin crew brought them their dinner on a tray. They could choose between chicken, beef and pasta and they all chose pasta. They got another soda and the food was in a foil tray with everything in different sections like a TV dinner. The best thing about it was the dessert, which was chocolate cake. Here's a picture, not of the chocolate cake, the picture of them, can you see it? Sitting in the airplane seat with their dinner. After dinner, the cabin lights were dimmed and people next to the windows pulled down the shades. Keith went to the bathroom and found out that the toilet flushed when you closed the lid and pressed a button. So when the others went, they knew. Then they watched the movie, wrapped themselves in the blankets provided by the airline and fell asleep. Chapter five, at Heathrow Airport in London. Keith was the first one to wake up when the cabin lights came back on. There he is, wide awake in the morning. People were opening up the window shades and he could see it was morning outside. The cabin crew were coming down the aisle with orange juice, water and tea or coffee. He took some orange juice for himself and wondered if he should take some for his friends. Luckily, Graham woke up soon after in time to get his own juice. He looked at his sister and said, oh, she's hard to wake up. At home, we have to call her at least three times on school mornings. Sure enough, Lila slept right through breakfast, which was basically a roll and butter and some cold cuts. And she only woke up when the captain announced that they would be landing in 30 minutes. I'm not hungry anyway, she mumbled as she sat up. Her hair was sticking up all over and her face had creases on it from where she'd been sleeping against the armrest. The plane landed with a small bump at Heathrow Airport and immediately one of the cabin crew announced, Welcome to London. Please stay seated until the plane comes to a complete stop at the gate. The plane rolled for what seemed like ages, but when it stopped, the crew opened the door and people began to get off. The friends pulled their backpacks down from the overhead bins and waited their return. It seemed to take forever. Then they had a long walk down three or four corridors until they came to a huge room where people were waiting in line to have their passports checked. Here's a picture, it's called the UK Passport Control. Can you see it there? The UK Passport Control. The hall is always crowded with people. We can all go through at once, said Grammy, as we're traveling together. Business or pleasure, said the immigration officer to the friends with a smile when they finally got to the desk. Uh, pleasure, said Keith, I guess. You mean you're not international bankers, said the officer. Uh, no, I think, said Keith. He ran their passports through an electronic reader and then said, have a nice holiday and gave them back. What did he mean? whispered Lila. Can't he see we're only kids, not international bankers? I think he was having a little joke, said Grammy with a laugh. Welcome to London. Chapter 6. Lord Henry picks them up. They walked into another huge hall where they found their suitcases going around a carousel waiting to be picked up. Then they followed Grammy Louise through a doorway with a green sign that said, customs, nothing to declare. That means if you don't have anything that you shouldn't take into the country, you can go right through. If you have something you shouldn't take in, then you have to stop. For example, you're not allowed to take in plants or unwrapped food or pets that haven't got all their papers and everything. Grammy Louise said that this was the way out if you had nothing in your bags that was illegal to bring into Great Britain. That included not only drugs and firearms, 
but also plants and animals because they might carry illnesses. Don't know if you can see this picture, it's rather small. Down the bottom there with the green thing, it says nothing to declare. That's where you walk through. It felt funny walking down a long room knowing that customs officers were watching you. They saw some people had been asked to open their suitcases, but no one stopped the friends or Grammy. From there, they went into the part of the airport where people were waiting for their friends or colleagues to arrive. Some were holding up signs with names or messages on them. Grammy Louise suddenly gave a big wave and a tall man came towards them holding out his hands. It was Lord Henry, but he looked like an ordinary person. He wasn't wearing a crown or anything. He shook hands with each of them and said, welcome to England. Good flight. Righty ho. Let's go to the car. It's parked right outside illegally. I'm sorry to say you're not supposed to leave your car there. I hope I haven't got a ticket. They all followed him and found his car. A traffic official was just looking at it with a phone in his hand. Hey, mate, he said, you can't leave your car there. I was just about to have it towed. Quick. Put your cases in the boot, said Lord Henry. The friends looked at each other. Boot, they whispered. What's the boot? Lord Henry laughed. I mean the trunk. That's what you call it in America. And the front of the car is the hood, isn't it? Here we call it the bonnet. This was strange, but even more strange was when they got in the car and they saw the steering wheel was on the wrong side. And then when Lord Henry started driving, he was on the wrong side of the road. Keith was just going to say something when he realised all the other cars were on the wrong side as well. Obviously, the wrong side was the right side. It took over an hour to get to the castle. After a while, they left the highway, which Lord Henry said was called the motorway, and they went along country roads with high hedges on either side. Then they saw a left-hand turn with a sign saying Castle Morgan. They turned in and went through tall gates up a driveway and came to a halt in front of an ancient stone building with turrets. Lord Henry got out first and opened the car door next to Lila. Welcome to Castle Morgan, he said. Please dismount from my trusty steed, madam, which made them all laugh. Perhaps you don't know what a steed is. That's a horse. It's an old fashioned word for horse. Obviously, Lila wasn't on a horse. You had to walk across a bridge to get to the huge wooden front door because there was a wide ditch all around the castle. Here's a picture of the castle. See it? It has turrets. You can't see it very well, but there's a moat all around. I'm going to explain about the moat. The ditch under the bridge used to be full of water. It was called a moat and you pulled up the bridge so no one could get in, said Lord Henry. It's called a drawbridge. Now the moat is empty and we leave the drawbridge down all the time. You can see there's also a portcullis, an iron gate that used to come down in front of the door to keep the enemies out. But it's always up now. We welcome people to come in and see the public rooms and our great treasure, the Queen's necklace. You can see it all later. But for now, a bite of lunch and a nap are the Lord's orders. Look, here's a portcullis. See it there? That slides down in front of the door so nobody can get in. Chapter 7, Castle Morgan. They trooped inside the castle and stood in a wide hall with stone floors. On the wall there were old weapons, swords and long poles with blades or spikes at the end. Look, here's a picture. See that? Pretty nasty looking weapons, aren't they? These used to be used in jousting, said Lord Henry, when he saw the children looking. That's when knights tried to knock each other off their horses. They're very fierce looking, aren't they? 
protect, to protect themselves, they wore metal suits of armor over their whole body, like the one over there. And against the wall, there was something that looked like a strong looking person, not very tall, completely covered in a metal suit topped by a helmet. Everything was covered except the eyes. It was not as tall as Lord Henry, in fact, not a lot taller than Keith, though much wider. People used to be shorter, explained Lord Henry. Our ancestors didn't have all the good food we enjoy these days. See that shield on the wall with the image of the three doves? That's the Morgan family coat of arms or personal identification. They couldn't see each other's faces when they wore their armour, so they wore a sort of apron with their family identification over the top. That's why it's called a coat of arms, although it's not really a coat. The coat of arms usually had a motto too, nearly always written in Latin. The House of Morgan family motto is Pax Honoris Atque, which means peace and honour. That's why it has doves. They represent peace. Look, see the pictures? There's the picture of the coat of arms. A, looks like a person completely covered in armour. Oh, excuse me, not a coat of arms. That is a suit of armour. It's a suit made out of metal. And then they used to put this coat of arms over the top. You see, this thing here is with all the, um, look, what looks like arrows on it. That's actually like an apron that went over the top of the armour. And then uh, Lord Henry's family, he didn't, that was not his coat of arms. This is his coat of arms, the one with the three doves. And we didn't have a picture of that, but it would, in fact, a pic that picture would have been worn over the top of the armour, like this one. The children looked all around them. Here we are in the Great Hall, continued Lord Henry. People have always had important meetings here, usually ending with a feast. There was a sort of rule that you couldn't make an enemy of somebody you'd eaten with, so there's always been a long rule for e a long table for eating together. Important people sat at the table, and less important ones sat on the floor, which would have been covered with straw, not rugs like we have now. And people only had a knife for cutting bread and meat. There were no forks, and they didn't eat a lot of vegetables. Sounds good to me, said Lila, who didn't like many veggies. And after they cut up their food, if there were no forks, did they just eat with their hands? Yes, said Lord Henry, like a lot of people do in America today, don't they? With hamburgers and pizza and chicken wings. But they would just drop the bones anywhere. Nowadays we eat in the family quarters at the back of the castle. You may also throw the bones on the floor there if you like, but I don't recommend it as you'd have to clear it up yourself. And his eyes crinkled with laughter. Lord Henry liked to joke. At the end of the hall was a staircase, and they could hear voices coming from the top of the stairs. Lord Henry said there was a tour group visiting upstairs in the old part of the castle. Here it is, the picture of the staircase. Chapter 8, Time Zones and Tea Time. The kitchen was through a door marked private, no entry, at the end of the Great Hall. It was a bright modern room, nothing like the Great Hall. On the table there was a plate of carrot sticks with dip and cut up apples. Help yourself, said Lord Henry. I'm making baked beans on toast. He put on an apron and went to the stove. I used to love that when I was a lad. The friends looked at each other and Keith shrugged. Their parents had told them they had to be polite and eat whatever they were given when they were in someone else's home. So although baked beans on toast sounded weird, when it was ready, they all ate it. Actually, it was delicious. The baked beans tasted different from American ones, though. Then they had individual trifles, which is a dessert with layers of cake, jello, fruit and custard, and then cream on top. Graham ate three of them. Here's a picture. 
trifles. See that? After that, they all trooped upstairs. They trooped up an old winding stone staircase. Here's a picture. You see it? Look at that. See? The steps are all made of stone and they go round and round till they get to the top. They went up and up until they found themselves in one of the round turrets at the very top. It had been converted into a bedroom with three beds in it and a thick carpet on the floor. It was a round room with narrow windows from where you could see everything for miles around. They used to fire flaming arrows from here down on anyone trying to get into the castle, said Lord Henry. But I hope you won't do anything like that while you're here. We need the tourists. Please don't set fire to them. They all laughed. Then he carried on. I've put all three of you in here as I thought you would like to be together. But if Lady Lila prefers her own quarters, there's another room down the end of the hall past the bathroom in the opposite turret. Lila thought that she would much rather stay with her brother and their friend. Lord Henry and Grammy wished them a nice nap and all three collapsed on the beds. After about an hour and a half, Grammy Louise woke them up saying it was better not to sleep any longer now because they wouldn't be able to sleep that night. They needed to adjust to British time, which is usually five hours ahead of New York time. British time comes from a place called Greenwich. It's spelled Greenwich, but pronounced Greenwich. Greenwich Mean Time, or GMT. Greenwich is a place in London. There's a red line on the ground called the Prime Meridian from which all the world's time is calculated. New York time, or Eastern Standard Time in the USA, is usually GMT minus five, which means it's five hours behind Greenwich Mean Time. I'm going to show you this picture, but you won't be able to see very much. It's a picture of the Prime Meridian, and the Prime Meridian in Greenwich is zero. It's zero, zero. It's the place from which all time is measured. You can visit it if you like. You can stand on it. You can stand on zero time. Chicago time is in the central time zone, which is GMT minus six or six hours behind. And Los Angeles is GMT minus eight. Grammy Louise said they needed to try to stay awake at least another five hours to adjust to the new time zone. And it would take about three days to get used to it. The friends went down to the kitchen where Lord Henry was just pouring boiling hot water from a kettle into a teapot. Time for a nice cup of tea and a biscuit, he said with a smile. Biscuit? The friends had only ever eaten biscuits with fried chicken and it seemed weird to have them with a cup of tea. Actually, they would have all preferred a soda and a cookie. But they remembered what their parents had said about eating what they were given. Lord Henry poured them each a cup of tea and said, milk and sugar? And they nodded. Then he put down a plate of not biscuits, but different cookies. Some had cream in the middle. We call the white ones custard creams and the black ones bourbon biscuits, said Lord Henry. And then there's digestive biscuits. They're just plain. They're good for dunking in your tea. Here's a picture. You see that? See the brown ones there that are called Bourbon biscuits. These are called custard creams. And over here, the plain ones there, like that, those are digestive biscuits. They're good for dunking in. But my favorites, he said, after taking a sip of his tea, are squashed fly biscuits, as we used to call them when I was a boy. He laughed. They're biscuits with raisins in. Their real name is Garibaldi biscuits. So biscuits are actually cookies and they have names, asked Keith. Yes, said Lord Henry. Sorry, I forgot you called them cookies. No problem, said Graham. I like these Bourbon biscuits. He reached for another one and the tea isn't too bad either. I like dunking those digestive biscuits in, said Lila. Don't eat all the cookies, Graham. You mean biscuits, said her brother. 
Chapter 9. The Queen's Necklace. After their tea, the friends followed Lord Henry into the Great Hall, where a group of tourists were gathered. The group is just going in to see the Queen's Necklace, said Lord Henry. It's the great treasure of Castle Morgan. It belonged to Queen Elizabeth I. The legend is that she left it behind when she came to visit the castle just before she died in 1603, and there was no chance to give it back. It's open to the public in the afternoons. Mike, the tour guide, will show you. Lila and Keith joined the line of people going off a room into the Great Hall, but Graham stayed behind looking at the weapons. The necklace was kept in a special locked case in a room next to the Great Hall. Mike told the group the story of how the Queen had left it behind and then said it's pure gold with diamonds in the shape of flowers all around. In the centre of each flower is an emerald, which they say was chosen as a contrast to the Queen's red hair. We don't know how much it cost when it was made, but today the value is many millions of pounds. Here, this picture. Picture of the necklace, you see. What is a pound? whispered Lila to Keith, who always knew that type of thing. It's British money, like we have dollars. One pound is worth about one dollar twenty-five cents, he whispered back. Wow, so the necklace is worth even more millions in dollars, said Lila. Just then, Graham came walking quickly up to them, looking a bit scared. Guess what? he whispered excitedly. I saw eyes in the helmet of the suit of armour in the hall. But when I got closer, they were gone. I tried to see inside, but it was too dark. Eyes? whispered the other two in amazement. Yes, insisted Graham. Eyes inside the helmet. Hey, look. Can you see that? Eyes in the helmet. <clears throat> oh, it was just your imagination, said Lila. All the time zones playing tricks on you. Your eyes are acting weird. No, really, I saw it, protested Graham, forgetting to whisper. I know I did. Luckily, the rest of the group was too busy watching Mike opening the case the Queen's necklace was in to hear him. Mike quickly punched a code onto the keypad on the display case. They heard a click, and then he punched in another code. There was another click, and he lifted the lid and took out the necklace. He held it up, and the diamonds sparkled in the light. Ooh, <gasps> said most of the women in the group. Let's go look at those eyes in the armour, said Keith. The three friends walked away while Mike was answering questions about the necklace. They ran back into the hall and up to the suit of armour. Keith peered into the helmet's eyes. Nothing. He tapped on the metal. It sounded perfectly normal. Come on, there's nothing here, he said. Sorry, Graham, but I think it must have been your imagination. And we're missing the rest of the tour. The three friends ran around to where they could see the tail end of the group going up the grand staircase. They followed along and went into the bedrooms, or bed chambers, as Mike called them. Obviously, no one was sleeping in them anymore, and they all looked pretty dusty and dark. The walls were covered in wood panels, and every room had a fireplace. The beds all had drapes hanging above and around them. Mike said it was because the rooms were so cold. All the castle walls were made of blocks of stone and never really warmed up, even in the summer. The drapes around the beds helped keep the people warm at night. They used to wear nightcaps for the same reason, like in the Wee Willy Winky nursery rhyme. The best bedroom was the Queen's Chamber. It was bigger than the others and had a bed with blue hangings with embroidery all over. The head of the bed was very high and had a big round carving with the letters E-R on it. Mike said the E stood for Elizabeth and the R stood for Regina, which is Latin for Queen. Look. don't think you can see the bedroom very well, maybe, a little bit. There's the bedroom with the bed with all the drapes. And there's E-R, very fancy letters. I'm going to make a sign like that for my bed when I get home, said Lila. It would be L-R. Lila Regina. Oh boy, said Graham and Keith together. As they were leaving the Queen's chamber, Mike gave a huge sneeze. 
Sorry, folks, he said, sniffling. It's the dust. Five hundred year old dust. And as the group laughed, he pulled a handkerchief out of his pocket. And Keith saw a group of something sparkling before Mike stuffed it back in again. But he forgot about it almost immediately as one of the tour group asked a question. You see that? Can you see there's a, something sparkling in his pocket? I hope it isn't rude to ask, said one of the visitors, but how did people go uh, to the bathroom? It's a good question, said Mike. The Queen's bedchamber has a tub for a bath. Queen servants had to carry out jugs or pails of hot water to pour in. But for going to the potty, people used to keep chamber pots under the bed or special chairs with pots underneath. And the servants would have to carry away the mess and throw it away outside into the moat. Oh, yuck, said Lila. I wouldn't want to be one of those servants. But what else could they do? asked Keith reasonably. Don't forget that flushing toilets with pipes to carry the stuff away weren't invented until centuries later. Trust Keith, he always knew that sort of thing. Chapter 10. Crime Solvers Inc. is created. After the tour, the friends were all feeling very droopy and decided to go for a walk to stay awake. They had only slept a few hours on the plane and then had that nap, so they were really tired. As they left through the huge front door, another tour group was forming, the last one of the day. There always seemed to be crowds of people in the Great Hall. They went back over the moat, which Graham said he now imagined as one sort of big bathroom, and looked up at the castle. There were four turrets, and they decided theirs was the one in the back on the left. They walked around the castle, and saw a much more modern annex built onto the back. Mm -hmm. That must be where the kitchen and family area is, said Keith. They found a door and trooped into the kitchen, where they found Lord Henry and Grammy Louise talking. Would you like to watch TV for a bit until dinner, asked Lord Henry. He showed them into a cosy den with a flat screen TV and they all flopped on the sofa. They were surprised to find that they could get pretty much all the same shows here as at home. Lord Henry told them that British people loved American programs. His own favourite was CSI. I like that too, said Keith. I want to be a forensic investigator. What about you, Lila? asked Lord Henry. I want to be a vet, a horse vet, she replied. And you, Graham? A professional basketball player, cried Graham, jumping up and pretending to shoot a basket. Well, that's an interesting combination, laughed Lord Henry. If there's a crime about a basketball player who gets away on a horse, you can all be called in to investigate. Yes, and we can call ourselves Crime Solvers Inc., said Graham. What does Inc. mean, said Lila. I don't know, it just sounds good, said her brother. I think it means incorporated, laughs Lord Henry. And this is the place of your incorporation, Castle Morgan. Yay! Crime Solvers Inc. of Castle Morgan, cried the friends and all high-fived each other. It was after 8pm by the time they finished dinner. The sun was still high in the sky and it didn't seem like night time at all. Why is it so light out? asked Keith. At home by now it will be beginning to get dark. Well, said Lord Henry, if you look at a map of the world with the lines of latitude shown, you'll see that Great Britain is almost as far north as the Eskimos in Canada. In the north in the summertime, it stays light at night. If you go to Finland or Iceland, it hardly gets dark at all. The United States is much further south and it gets dark earlier in the summer. In the winter, though, is exactly the opposite. It stays, it gets dark earlier in Britain than in New York or Chicago. And in the far north, such as Iceland, it stays dark practically all day. It's all to do with the angle of the sun. 
I've got a map here, but I don't think you can see it. I don't think they, you can see it at all well. It's a map. There. Um, hang on a second. Sorry. No, I can't get it. I can't show it to you. You'll have to get the book and look at it. And you will see that if you draw a line across from London, where London is on the map, you draw a line across. It doesn't come to New York. It comes right up to the north of Canada because the United States is lower down than Britain is. So Britain is much further north than New York. You'll see if you look at the map. I'm going to bed even though it's light out, said Graham. I'm so tired. Me too, chorused the other two, and they tiredly climbed up the turret stairs. I'm glad we've got a real bathroom, said Lila as she went to brush her teeth. I wouldn't want to carry a chamber pot full of you-know-what down all those stairs. Maybe you could throw it out of one of the windows into the moat, said Graham. That would be a good way to scare off attackers. I think they actually did that, said Keith, who knew everything. Oh, yuck, said Lila. And there's a picture, an old, old picture. You can see it. The lady is throwing heaven knows what out of the window on top of the man underneath. Chapter 11. The Queen's Necklace Disappears. The friends slept late the next morning because their bodies told them it was five hours earlier than it really was. They didn't wake up until 10 a.m. and even then, as far as they were concerned, it was five in the morning. They got dressed and stumbled downstairs. Two strangers were sitting at the kitchen table. Oh, my dears, said Grammy Louise when she saw them. These gentlemen are from the police. The most awful thing has happened. The Queen's necklace has been stolen. After the tour group's leave, Lord Henry always sets the alarms for the doors and windows, and then, before going to bed, he checks in on the necklace. Last night I was with him when he set the alarms, but he didn't do the necklace until later because we stayed up chatting for a long time. When we went in to check it, the case was open and it was gone. We called the police and they've been here all night taking fingerprints and investigating. Lord Henry came in looking worried. I blame myself. I should have checked the necklace when I set the front door alarm after the last visitors had gone. I usually do. No one can have gone in or out after that unless they had the security code for the front door. It's different from the ones for the necklace, too. The case hasn't been broken into, so someone must have known the codes for that. Mike swears the necklace was there when he left. Then he added, the police officers here want to question you three. Did you see anything unusual yesterday? The friends were silent for a moment, and then Keith said slowly, I don't want to get Mike into trouble because he's so nice, but I did see something sparkling in his pocket when he took out his handkerchief yesterday. He stuffed it back in quickly. One of the police officers immediately left the room and came back a little while later with Mike. Now, he said sternly to Keith, repeat what you just said. Keith gulped and told his story again. And then he said, I'm sorry, Mike, but I had to say what I saw. No problem, mate, smiled Mike. I can easily explain. Look, from his pocket, he took out his folded up handkerchief, undid it and displayed a pretty necklace. It certainly sparkled, but it wasn't the Queen's necklace. I bought this yesterday on my way to work from the antique shop in the village. It's for my wife for our anniversary. She'd seen it and said she liked it, so I got it as a, as a surprise. It didn't have a box, so I rolled it in my handkerchief and put it in my pocket. I'd forgotten it was there when I sneezed yesterday and nearly pulled it out. I've still got to get a box for it. Oh, thank goodness, said Keith with relief. Then Graham blurted out. What about the eyes? What eyes? asked several of the grown-ups. The eyes in the suit of armour in the great hall. I know I saw them, even though the officers said it was my imagination. The others said it was my imagination. The two police officers stood up and they all trooped into the hall. And they stood in front of the suit of armour. Nah, 
It's too small for anyone to hide in, said one of the officers. I looked at it last night and I thought the same thing. A grown man couldn't fit in there. But I know I saw eyes, said Graham. And if it's not a grown up, it must be a kid. Then he spoke to the suit of armour. Come out, we won't hurt you. To their amazement, the suit began to rock a little, and then a piece of it fell to the ground in the back, and a child of about their own age climbed out, looking sad and guilty. But, but I know you, cried Lord Henry. You're Erin's son, Bradley, aren't you? He turned to the police officers. She comes in to do some cleaning for us. Then he looked back at the child. Don't tell me you stole the necklace. Bradley slowly lifted his shirt and underneath, fixed around his neck, was the Queen's necklace. I took it to sell for my mum, he said in a small voice. She needs special medicine from America and we don't have enough money to pay for it. You'd better come along with us, young man, said one of the officers, taking hold of Bradley's arm. No, no, if you please, said Lord Henry. I'm sure we can sort this out. No need for official action here. We have the necklace back, no harm done. I want to hear the whole story. He shook hands with each of the officers. I'll take it from here. If your superiors have any questions, please ask them to call me. Lord Henry led the group back into the kitchen. Now, he said to Bradley, first things first, if you've been in there since yesterday afternoon, you must be starving. Would you like scrambled eggs on toast? In fact, you three haven't had breakfast either, so scrambled eggs for four, coming up. In between mouthfuls of eggs and toast, Bradley told his story. His mum, that's what English people say, not mum, worked for a cleaning service and one of her jobs was doing the castle. She always brought Bradley with her when he didn't have school because she couldn't afford a babysitter. He didn't have a dad. It was just him and his mom. Like me, said Keith and smiled at Bradley. I always liked looking at the Queen's necklace and I saw Mike do the code so often I worked out what they were, said Bradley. When I heard my mum telling the neighbour about the medicine and the money, I decided I would get it and sell it. I used to play around hiding in the armour when my mum was cleaning. I knew I could get in, so I hid there yesterday afternoon. I was really scared when you saw my eyes, Graham, but I ducked down and you couldn't see me in the dark. It was quite easy to get the necklace out of the case, but I didn't know about the alarms on the front door. I, Lord, I heard Lord Henry talking about it with your grandmother and I realised I couldn't get out. Then the police came and, well... I was stuck. Good thing you were, young man, said Lord Henry. If you had tried to sell the necklace, you would have been arrested for sure. It's a very well-known piece of jewellery. After breakfast, Lord Henry took Bradley home. His mother burst into tears when she heard what her son had done or tried to do for her. She didn't know whether to be happy or sad. She told Lord Henry that the medicine she had talked about was something they'd read about in a magazine. She didn't really even know if it would be good for her. They had a long talk and Lord Henry said he would help her if he could. Well, he said when he arrived back at the castle, that's a mystery solved. Good thing you were here. I don't think we would have looked in the suit of armour if you hadn't seen the eyes, Graham. We never would have guessed there was a boy in there. No problem, said Graham. We love mysteries, said Lila. After all, added Keith, we are Crime Solvers, Inc. The end. And that's the end of my story. Now, if you would like to get one of these from Amazon, you can buy one. And at the end of it, there are all sorts of questions and discussions that you can have with your mum and dad or with your brothers and sisters. And of course, you can always read the book again yourself and look at all the pictures. I didn't show you all of the pictures. I showed you some of them. But I hope you've enjoyed it. And I hope you're still sitting comfortably. And now we're done. Bye bye.